morning, we want to welcome you to Silver Creek uh, Church of God and our online service today. I want to start off by sharing a scripture passage that I just love to say um, whatever morning it is, but especially on Sunday morning. And it's this verse that this is the day the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day the Lord has made and we are going to rejoice and be glad in it. We're so glad that you can join us uh, today online and we're looking forward to June 14th and that is our tentative and hopefully it will be our permanent date when we will go back on campus at church and we'll be able to worship together and we'll do it in a safe and uh, very friendly manner for everyone and so we're looking forward to that I know I'm looking forward to that but in the meantime we want to continue to be able to worship the Lord and so I want to pray for us today and uh, just pray that you will just uh, meet God in a special way today. So let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for the, another opportunity we have to worship you today. I pray for your Holy Spirit to be here, to guide us, to direct us. We thank you that uh, just sort of like a, a family on a Skype or Zoom, um, we can gather together as your church family. And we are brothers and sisters in the Lord, and we just pray, dear Lord, today that you will speak to us, you will encourage us, you will inspire us. And I pray, dear Lord, whether we are singing, whether we are giving today, whether we are uh, praying today or just listening to your word, I pray, dear Lord, that you'll be near us and guide us and direct us. And it is for your glory that we pray in Jesus' name. Hello, Silver Creek. It is great to be with you today. Uh, as we worship the Lord together, we will be singing Revive Us Again and Bless the Lord, O My Soul, and also Breathe on Me, Breath of God. And I pray that these songs would be refreshing to your soul and to your spirit as we worship the Lord together. <laughs>
encourage you to pause and write out your check if you haven't done that already. We want to worship the Lord now through prayer. Uh, one of the things that Jesus said that his people should be people of prayer, that the house of God is the house of prayer. And we need to be praying today. Uh, my heart has been broken, uh, like many of you, as you probably watched the, the video by now of George Floyd. And earlier this month, we had the shooting of Ahmaud Aubrey. And I just want to pray for us as a country. I mean, we've been suffering through this pandemic. People have been um, trapped indoors and they've been fearful and stressful and full of anxiety. And then this week, we saw brutality and murder and what many are calling racism and hatred and what we need to do is we need to pray I know some people think prayer doesn't work but we need to be praying for our country because this is a problem that only Jesus Christ himself can solve and we as Christians we need to do our part and we need not only to stand up and speak for justice. Jesus Christ came to bring justice to those who were treated unjustly. Likewise, we as a church, we need to stand up and we need to pray. So I want to pray for our country. I want to pray for our offering because we're going to worship the Lord through giving. And again, I thank you for your generosity during this time. And I would encourage you to remain faithful to giving. And we have been making changes at the church. We continue to try to support our missionaries and support the things that we have designated already this year in our budget. And we want to do whatever we can to, to make a difference in our community and in our world. So continue to remain faithful to giving. And as we go through this transition, um, one of the things we can control and one of the things that we can contribute is with our tithes and offerings. And so I want to pray for our offering. And lastly, I just want to pray for us as a church and continue to send in your prayer requests and I don't feel comfortable listing everybody's prayer request online, but we want to pray for you. And even though it's a generic prayer, we want to pray for each other. And the best way to do that is to let us know your prayer request, your needs, so that we can be praying for you. And hopefully by now you've been contacted by someone on the care team so that uh, we can pray for you. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you. And may we never forget that you are our Heavenly Father. And right now, as you look down upon the United States and throughout the world, I know that you have to have tears in your eyes and your heart broken. We just pray for the divide that exists in our country. I pray, dear Lord, for George Floyd, and I pray, dear Lord, for the police officer. I don't know his name. I don't know what was going on in his heart and his mind and why he did not let up and release Mr. Floyd, but I pray, dear Lord, for our country. May we be united, and most of all, may we be united around Jesus Christ, but May we as a church and may we as Christians, may we stand up and shout and scream for, for life. Everybody's life matters because we are created in the image of God. We were created with dignity and purpose. And so we pray, dear Lord, for our country, just a, a spiritual awakening, a spiritual revival. But I pray, dear Lord, that the the response to Mr. Floyd's death and the 
response to the injustice that our black brothers and sisters in the Lord are feeling. I pray, dear Lord, for the people of color who feel like they have been discriminated against and, and they have in so many different ways that we don't understand as white people. I pray, dear Lord, just for healing and reconciliation. I pray, dear Lord, for our country. I pray, dear Lord, for our offering this morning. I pray, dear Lord, that we as as Christ followers here at Silver Creek, may we continue to be generous. May we continue to give first. May we continue to trust you with our finances. May we continue to support our missionaries and to support our mission to reach our community for Christ. Help us, dear Lord, in the midst of our own transition to be faithful to give. And finally, dear Lord, I pray for us as a church. And there's many needs out there. Emotional needs, physical needs, spiritual needs, health needs, financial needs. And I pray, dear Lord, as the prayer requests come into our church, I pray we will be faithful to pray for each other, to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And I pray, dear Lord, that we will truly care about one another. I pray, dear Lord, as we approach June 14th, I pray we can continue to get ready and get things clean and safe and orderly and the proper signage. And I pray, dear Lord, that we will be able to worship once again together in community. We thank you that we have the privilege to watch online, but we pray, dear Lord, for the privilege to gather together. And I pray, dear Lord, as... I open up the word of God in a little bit. I pray, dear Lord, that you will give us those ears to hear and hearts to feel and hands to serve. We love you and we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen.
passage, and it's the passage that we're going to be looking at in just a little bit, is found in Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. And if you just want to pause and get your Bible or take out your phone, I would encourage you to read it in um, something that you can see and feel and touch and highlight. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to be in verse 7, and we're going to be looking at the church in Philadelphia today. This is what it says in verse 7. It says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. It says, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one, no one is able to shut. I know you have but little power or little strength, probably talking about spiritual strength there, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and down, bow down before you, before your feet. And they will learn that I have always loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those or to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers or the one who overcomes, that's why we're doing this series, Overcomers, to the one who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. May the Lord bless the reading of Scripture this morning. Oh 
I ran into one of the guys that I went to high school with at a restaurant. And I have to admit, I was a little embarrassed. And again, I haven't seen this person for years. And I've lived outside of the Fort Wayne area for many years now and just recently moving back. And so I was walking into uh, one of my restaurants that I enjoy to eat at. And lo and behold, uh, one was a very good friend that I went to high school with. And then there was another friend who, who I knew and I, I called him by his name. And right away he started saying that he, he really appreciated me in high school. And, and I had to almost take a double take and I sort of laughed. And he goes, I, you just made being on the tennis team so enjoyable for me. And I just sort of laughed and, and he just was like, you were such a, a, a great dude. And if I could just pause, and I'm glad that he was saying I was a great dude, but I, in high school, I wasn't known as being uh, Pastor Mark at that time. Probably I had a different name. And sometimes I was a little bit on the crazy side, the wild side. But I was taken back by the words that he was saying to me to, to affirm me and to affirm the role that I played a little bit in his life, especially on the tennis team. And some of it included some of the crazy driving that I did. And I'm embarrassed that I used to drive that way. And as he was sharing, and, and I was just saying, yeah, but you remember my lifestyle back then. You remember the way that I conducted myself. And he's like, yeah, but the one thing I appreciated about you, you were, you were true, you were honest, and you were sort of authentic to who you were. You were a joy to be around. And I was just sort of thinking about that when I was thinking about the message today as it relates to the church in Philadelphia. And as we will see, um, some people refer to the church in Philadelphia throughout the history, people that have commented on the church in Philadelphia they call it the true church or the authentic church, the church that, that wasn't playing games. They, they were very serious. They were authentic. They were true to their name or true to their character. Their name, Philadelphia, literally means brotherly love. You probably have heard that before. And so there was a, a deep friendship. There was a brotherly love. And as, as I'm starting to explore and dig deeper into the Word of God and to study about the church, uh, I was reading this past week that brother and sister was, especially brother and brother, was the highest form of a relationship in Jesus' day. And so it was even higher than a husband and a wife relationship. It was the brother to brother. And so... When, when you would say, when Jesus started to say that we are brothers and sisters because of our faith in Jesus Christ and that we're part of God's family. And as Paul developed this concept of being brothers and sisters in the Lord and being adopted into God's family and God's children, they were talking really about the hallmark of what it means to be the church. And so the church in Philadelphia was known as this true church. It was an authentic church. It was a real church where people loved each other with the highest form of love, a family type of love. And again, a love for brother to brother, sister to sister. And again, right away, when you use an analogy like that, some of you say, Mark, don't talk about my family. I grew up with a dysfunctional family, or I don't talk to my sister, or my sister and I, we always fight, or my brother and I, we always fight. My brother, I've never gotten along with him. My brother thinks he's better than I, or whatever. I just want you to strip away and understand that the church was called the church in Philadelphia because they had a deep love for one another, just as Christ had commanded them to love one another as brothers in the Lord. But this church was also known as the true church because there was an open door. And going back to my conversation with uh, my friend that I was talking about at the restaurant, 
If, if I would have been more on fire for the Lord, if I would have had my act together, so to speak, I would have had an open door because he respected who I was and that I could enjoy life and I could enjoy other people's company. And if I would have known Christ better, I would have had an open door to share Christ. And I really am glad I can give this message today because over the course of my growth as a pastor and as I've worked as ch in churches, either consulting, coaching, or being their settled pastor, or being on staff at a church, or now being a transitional interim pastor, I, I try to encourage the church to, to be serious about the open doors that are before them, and that they need to invest in people's lives so that they can invite them, not, not just invite them to church or to church gatherings, but invite them into a relationship with Jesus Christ. At the last church I was at, we had a whole campaign called Sit With Me, and we wanted people to invite people to, to sit with us at church, but it was, went beyond just inviting people to sit with us at church. We wanted people to feel the freedom to sit with us at breakfast, at lunch, in our homes, and we wanted people to be able to sit with us that were prodigals, or people to sit with us who were heartbroken, or they were grieving, or they were hurting. Again, with, with what's happening in our world today, to, to be able to, to sit with someone of a different color, or a different background. And, I, and again, I know that it's, it's different for us in a, in a county that is probably 97, 98% white. There are different types of people, though. Maybe it's a, it's a social status or a financial status or a work status or, or maybe it's a little bit of um, a family feud going on and, or people on the other side of the track, so to speak, that we don't associate with. We need to take advantage of this open door and we need to sit with others so that we can have an opportunity to share Christ with. So I want to jump into this passage today, and again, I would encourage you to pause if you don't have your Bible, go get your Bible, and turn to Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, and we're going to look at the church in Philadelphia, and without uh, going through each church, just remind you in this series, and I encourage you to go back and listen to the message, but in this series, we have, have used two words to describe each church, and what we are called to do. So we were called, in the first church in Ephesus, we were called to love first. In the second church, we were called to stay true to our faith in the midst of persecution and suffering. In the third church, we were called to expose error. In the fourth church, we were encouraged to pursue purity. And then last week, the church in Sardis, we were encouraged not to just be starters, but to finish strong. And this is true for us as a church, and this is true for us as individuals. And in this series, hopefully you've caught on by now that each church is challenged, and most churches are challenged to repent and change. Interesting, the church of Philadelphia, since it's a true church... It's sort of the church, the authentic church, is not even told to repent or change. But most churches are called to repent and change. And in that corporate challenge, there is an individual challenge. And so if you don't participate in our church or you've just been listening online or listening on Facebook or YouTube, there is an individual challenge. And so the challenge today is going to be to share Christ. Uh, to share Jesus Christ with our family and friends, with our neighbors, with our enemies that do not know Jesus Christ. And again, over the past few years, I've been trying to encourage those who are Christ followers that they need to inspire others to follow Jesus Christ. They need to inspire those people that they live with the people that they work with, the people that they study with, the people that, that they play with, the, 
they enjoy each other's company and we need to inspire these people that we live, pray, study, work with. We need to inspire them to follow Jesus because as I've said earlier when I first came to Silver Creek that following Jesus will make your life better and it will make you better at life because Jesus said I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. At the same restaurant, I was doing a little bit of studying, and it was interesting, I was walking by, and I don't know if the person was a believer and a believer, or a believer and an unbeliever, but I heard the person say to the other person, John 10.10, 10, which is, Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly, and that the thief comes to rob and to steal and to destroy, but Jesus came to bring life. And that's what we need to be constantly doing, just like they were doing in this restaurant, one man to another man saying, John 10, 10 is the answer. Jesus came to give us life, eternal life, a life of hope, a life of joy. So let's get started. So the main idea is going to be to share Christ. Notice in, in verse 7, there is a description of the character of Jesus Christ. See, in each of these churches and in each of the challenges and where they are commended and where they are condemned, it's, it's all based upon the character of Christ. And so as I, as I come up with my main ideas each week, I, I do it based upon the character of Christ and the character of who Jesus Christ is. And we as a Christ follower, again, if you're, if you're not only concerned about the church today, but if you are concerned about following Jesus Christ, you need to look at the character of Jesus Christ. And notice what it says about Jesus Christ. The words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David. Notice this, who opens imply doors that no one can shut and shuts doors that no one opens. The character of Christ is what I would say described here as holy and true. You see, nothing destroys, I'm going to take the negative side, nothing destroys a church's reputation or opportunity to share Christ, nothing destroys that opportunity is when a, when a Christian is a hypocrite or when they're not living their lives for Christ. It's, it's pretty hard to have an open door to share Christ, sort of like I was saying in my high school days, if I'm not living a holy life, if I'm not living on fire for Jesus Christ, if there is a secret life. Here's what I want us to see, though. He says not only is Christ holy, but he is true. Literally, he is authentic. He is true to his name, his character, his reputation. That's the way we need to be as Christ. That's what we need to be as a church. And again, one of the questions I've been trying to ask us as a church, what do we want to be known for? Or what are we known for? And hopefully we are known for being authentic and true that we're known for being a church that loves God and loves others. So notice that this character of Christ goes on to verse 8. He says, I know your works. We looked at that last week, but I want to focus in on this week. He says, Behold, I have set before you an open door. Now in my Bible, I circled that. I highlighted that. I would encourage you to circle and highlight it as well. He says, I have put before you an open door which no one is able to shut. He says, I know that you have but little power, or as I mentioned, little strength, some of your translations may say, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Here's how Christ commends them. Here is the commendation. The, the word of praise. Basically, I've given you an open door because of your character. 
And I've given you an open door because you have kept my word. It's sort of what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Um, they have an open door because they've kept the word, but they've kept the word and God has given them an open door. Either way, he praises them. And again, this open door is what I say, an opportunity for us to share Jesus Christ with others. You see, too many Christians and too many churches have what I call mission drift. They've drifted away from their calling. As a church, the reason we exist is not just to have a holy huddle every Sunday. Uh, the reason we exist as a church is to fulfill the Great Commission, which is to make disciples by going, by baptizing, and by teaching. As Christ followers, Jesus, he, before he went to the cross, he gathered his disciples together and he says, I, I give you a new commandment. Love one another just as I have loved you. But too many Christians in too many churches have drifted from this calling. We've drifted away from what God wants us to do. Obedience and character matters. Let me say it again. Obedience and character matters. This church in Philadelphia is praised and lifted up as an example on what we should be doing because they were obedient. And they understood their character and their name and their reputation matter. Again, this is easy. Maybe it's easier to apply to us as individual Christ followers, but it's easy to apply, I think, as well to the church. As a church, if we remain obedient the great commandment to love one another just as Christ has loved us. I'm not talking about being a friendly church. I'm talking about a church that genuinely loves one another, that can forgive one another, that can carry one another's burdens, that can confess their sins to one another, that can encourage one another, that can stir one another up to love and good deeds, that is understanding of their calling in life and truly, truly do care deeply, they can comfort one another, they can rejoice with one another. And when we do that as a church, guess what? God opens up a door. He opens up opportunities for us to share Christ. Now again, we, we maybe have confused this, not just at Silver Creek, but in the church in general, we think that the open door is an open door of an invitation for people to come into our church to meet Jesus. But I think Jesus never even saw that as a vision. His vision was, we're going to treat each other in such a way that we love one another that it's going to open up doors. That when people look at us and they'll say, ah, there's something special about you on the outside of the church building. There's something different. I love the way that you represent love and truth and grace. Now what's interesting in this church, if you recall every church, and especially Sardis, they had nothing that God praised and commended them for, and all it was was condemnation last week. And I tried to preach that as positively and as encouragingly as possible. But this church is the exact opposite. There is no condemnation. Just stop and think about that. Imagine standing before your Lord and Savior as a Christ follower. And it's sort of like a final exam or a final test. And the teacher says you got 100% back or you got 105% back. Jesus Christ is evaluating and he's saying, perfect. You have obeyed me. You've remained true. You've remained faithful. You see, this is what obedience does for you, both as a church and as a Christ follower. Obedience allows for you to have a different standing than disobedience does. We know this growing up in a home. As a child, if you disobey, you get attention from your mom and dad, but it's negative attention and it's usually discipline. 
But if you obey, there's none of that negative attention. There's usually praise and there's usually maybe a reward or some form of appreciation for your obedience. Obedience opens doors. And for us as Christ followers, we know that one day, I don't know for me, this, is, this drives me. I want to hear Jesus say to me, like in Matthew 25, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. But notice the challenge of Christ. And um, it's very interesting. He says, he says, I know that you have little power. Which, or a little strength, which again, this should be encouraging for us at Silver Creek. I know some of you think we're just a small rural church out in the middle of nowhere. But guess what? Obedience works anywhere. It works in rural areas, small towns, suburban areas, urban areas. And God knows what we have. And he says to them, I know you have little strength, yet you have kept my word, yet you have not denied my name. That means they have remained true to Christ-like character. Notice what he says, though. I just want to move forward in verse 10. He says, because you have kept my word about patient endurance. So again, he repeats the obedience or keeping the word. Because you have kept my word, patient endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. So some people think that this is for the rapture. And again, you can study commentaries. That is not my purpose, not my purpose really in being your transitional interim to, to tickle your fancy a little bit with eschatology or the study of end times. But some people think what Jesus is saying here, I'm going to take you from the tribulation. Notice verse 11 says, I'm coming soon. Jesus Christ is saying, I'm coming soon. But notice what he says. He says, hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. Hold fast. We've seen that repeated in the other churches. It, it means to cling to, to embrace, to hold on. It, it, it's like a mean game of tug of war. and You need to hold on. What are we holding on to? We're holding on to Jesus Christ. We're holding on to the Word of God. We're holding on to our faith. We're holding on to each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord. He says, hold on. This is the challenge of Christ so that no one may seize your crown. Again, without getting too complicated, we saw this in, a, in another situation with the other churches. The crown is a reward. It's a blessing for for us who persevere, who remain faithful, or like this church, the patient endurance. You see, we need, to, we need to hold fast, and we sort of need to guard our hearts or guard our calling. And what we need at Silver Creek Church is we need people who will guard our calling and make sure that we remain true to go and make disciples of all nations. That, to guard the commandment to love one another just as Christ has loved us. That we will guard it and will protect it. You know, this is so important, especially with my oldest son, but uh, with my children, try to emphasize, above all else, guard your heart. Well, what Jesus is saying here, guard your calling, because you are called with the crown. It means we as Christians, and I don't think many of us understand, we are servants, royal servants of the King of Kings, and we are called to make a difference in this kingdom, and because of that, we are going to receive a reward or a crown to rule and to reign with Jesus Christ. So that is the challenge, and notice this charge that he says, and to the one in verse 12, to the one who conquers or to the one who overcomes. This series is about being an overcomer. He says, what, what's going to happen to the overcomer? He says, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. I will make him or her a pillar in the temple of God, my God. And never shall he go, never, 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 ever shall he go out of it. 
and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of my city of my God and the new Jerusalem which comes down from my God out of heaven with my new name on it. And here is the final charge that we need to continue to remain true, remain faithful to our calling. And if so, guess what? We will overcome and God promises us a reward. Each one of these churches gives an individual, I believe, probably not, this is probably not a church reward, but it's an individual reward to each one of us as Christ followers. And he said, if you remain faithful and you hold on, hold fast, cling to Jesus Christ, cling to his word, you're going to have a permanent privilege. So when Christ comes back to establish his kingdom, we're going to reign and rule with Jesus Christ as co-heirs. And what he is saying, the pillar means permanency. You, and he said, no one will move you out. And again, that goes back to who Christ is. He's got the keys to open doors and close doors that no one else has the authority to open or close. And he's saying, you will have a permanency. And the, notice the name is repeated over and over again. I think there's something tied here to the privilege we have of being related to Jesus Christ, the name above all names. And because of that, we're going to have a special privilege. And I think he's emphasizing this that when he talks about earlier the, the synagogue of Satan and those who pretend to be Jews and who are not Jews, who actually hate you, he says that they will come and they will bow down before me or before them as Christians. Why? Because of the name of Jesus Christ, that the name everybody shall bow. So what is our next step? Well, obviously we're called, the main idea is to share Christ. In fact, maybe as we conclude today, maybe you need to say that with me. Share Christ. Share Christ. Have a vision. Let your eyes be awakened that you need to be sharing Jesus Christ. With this that uh, is going on in our country and as people speak about racism, whether they're, they're black leaders or black pastors or whether they're, they're white leaders or white pastors, everyone says we have to have a conversation. We need to talk about justice. We need to talk when we see racism and when we see hate and bigotry and all these isms. We need to speak out against injustice. Likewise, we need to, as Christ followers in churches, we need to speak Jesus Christ. And we need to see it as our open door. And today, more than ever, I want you as a church, as you're in transition, and we look forward to the new day for a new pastor, I want you to be able to see your calling to share Christ. I want you to feel that open door and I believe God has given you an open door right now. Open door to share Christ. And some of you may not see it or feel it. Then dream it. <laughs> dream about that open door that Christ is going to give us. And there was a movie. Uh, can't remember it, but it had Robin Williams in it. And he would challenge these boys to seize the day. To seize the day. He was a professor and a teacher. And he, he would write the famous Latin words up there that represented to seize the day. We need to seize the opportunity. <laughs> we can't get tomorrow back. We can't get today back. And pretty soon, tomorrow, we're not going to get that back. And so we need to seize the opportunity to share Christ. And you may say, Mark, I, I just don't get out very much anymore. How, how can I seize the opportunity? Again, I would encourage us, if you call Silver Creek your home, remain faithful to generosity so that we can share Christ. Create an open perspective. What do I mean by that? Be open. If, if you can't share Christ, be open to bringing in a pastor who can share Christ. Be open to a new pastor who can share ideas on how you as a church can share Christ. Be open to new ministries and programs. Lastly, I would encourage you 
to think outside the box. We as a church need to think outside the box because the last thing we want Jesus Christ to do is to shut the box or to shut the door. He's given us an opportunity and an open door and it's time for us to walk through. I hope this message was encouraging to you and inspiring and I want to do whatever I can to help you as a church walk through that open door. So now will you join me in a closing benediction and what I learned, I was over in Israel a few months ago and this is a blessing that they, they do quite regularly on the Sabbath and they, they pray it in their families and the, the head of the household prays it and the rabbi prays it and it, it was a priestly blessing. And so I want to give it to you as part of our church family. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he grant you his countenance and his peace until we meet again. God bless you and have a